there's an assignment that you'll do in this course where you can actually be in control of the world's leaders and produce a five-year plan which says we are going to cut our CO2 emissions this much. Someone else is going to cut theirs this much. And maybe we'll do some engineering work that will actually reflect more of the sunlight. And we could throw some money into that. And you can look at the bottom line of your economy. Can you do these things and keep your economy positive? The result is if you don't do nothing is the economy goes downhill because the effects of global warming are quite dramatic over time if it's totally left unabated. It's a very valuable exercise and like any exercise it's built on assumptions. There are references we'll give you that will detail all of the assumptions in this exercise. But it also shows the ability of different parts of the world to cooperate with one another. After all, Europe, maybe even the United States, can decide to cut their carbon emissions whereas China and India may continue to continue using fossil fuels at an accelerated rate and put more CO2 into the air. We're all on one planet though. So it isn't as though their CO2 stays over their country. This becomes a global effect heating up the whole planet. Cooperation and collaboration between countries and between regions will end up being important. Now, I want to introduce you to a um, friend and colleague of mine, uh, Professor Clifford Singer. He's been doing research over the last few years on climate modeling. And not just climate modeling in terms of how much CO2 and nitrous oxides and the like change the temperature of the planet, but also in the economics of the world. All of these energy resources come down to economics in the end. We use certain resources because they're more economical, they're cheaper to use than some other resource. So one of the important things in this type of effort is to say, how much money would you spend on reducing CO2 emissions? You might say, spending money on reducing CO2? That's the only way it's going to happen. Why does someone switch to an electric car as opposed to a fossil fuel car? If gasoline is cheap, why bother? Well, the only reason could be is if your government gives you a tax incentive to buy the electric car at a much cheaper price. Great. From the consumer's pocketbook, you'd be glad to do that. That costs the government money, which means it costs the country money, since the government's money comes from taxpayers. You can do an equation to see if this is profitable overall. If you have a model that says, how much does global warming cost you? So, we need to divide the planet up into regions. Regions that would potentially be affected the same way, or regions that would effectively have a unified policy. One of the regions is called, the, in this model, the U.S. Plus. Basically, it's the U.S. and Canada. It's the north, most of the North American landmass. Another one's called the European Union Plus. The European Union plus Russia. Another of these areas is Oceania. It includes the things around the Pacific Ocean. Korea, South Korea, Japan, Vietnam, Thailand, Cambodia, that part of Southeast Asia, the Philippines, Indonesia, Malaysia, and Australia. And you might say, wow, that's a lot of different countries. Are they really going to have one policy? Eh, they're in a similar part of the planet, and clearly it's the Korea and Japan that uses the energy resources from the Indonesia, Malaysia, and uh, Australia. So, okay, we'll lump them together. Our fourth group is China plus. Really, it's China plus maybe Mongolia and North Korea, but it's China. And another one is India. We'll lump a few more countries with India that surround it, but it's really the teeming mass of India. It makes a huge difference to the world what is done there. And then finally, it's the rest of the other 121 countries in the world, basically Africa, South America. Take these six regions. And in each of these regions, in its economic model, it's a very interesting graph. And here it is, is produced first for the U.S. And you can see on this graph that a little bit of temperature rise 
actually increases the gross domestic product for the U.S. plus region. You're saying, huh? Huh? A little bit of heat is good for us up here in North America? They were filming. It's zero out, and it's March. So, yes, but that's not typical. The reason this rise of temperature for at least a little while, for another half a degree or so, helps North America is that Canada has fertile land with water, but it's too cold and too short of a growing season. So if things warm up a little bit, the growing seasons move a little farther north, that's still an area that the North America could take advantage of. China is in a similar boat. China also profits if the temperature goes, and notice there's a line here at the current day, we are already experienced a 0.7 degree temperature rise. We have the historical data to prove that. So far, the Earth has warmed up 7 tenths of a degree centigrade. If it goes up again, another half a degree or so for China, China also has an advantage to their GDP for this small temperature gain. Now, there are other countries. The other groups of countries are all already on a negative slope. Anything warmer starts causing GDP loss. So the solid lines going across are at 0.78 degrees centigrade. That's the number. That is the most accepted number of how much global warming has so far taken place in the world. So the U.S., China, a little bit more warming is not an economic disaster. In all of the other places, continued warming directly affects GDP. So what about what we do, how we spend our money? You will have a homework assignment utilizing a spreadsheet. In this sheet, you can determine, in each of these countries, say US plus, what percentage of your money you want to spend to do two things. Geoengineering, this is in the form of sulfur injection, but it could be something else. And how much you want to spend on reducing CO2. This does not assume that we have some constant level, that that's today's use, we're never going up. No, this is saying using historical growth, China's still going to grow, India's going to grow. This is reducing it by how much from what would have happened anyway. And that takes money because you're going to have to invest money to be able to make those tax incentives or those structural changes to be able to change the amount of CO2 growth. So you can put these numbers in. And then you can see what the effect is in terms of the amount of carbon dioxide in the world and the amount of temperature change that goes with it. So first, let's say we do nothing. Let's say all those cells stay zero. <clears throat> That's energy as is. Growth happens normally. As the temperature gets hotter, GDP starts to fall. And you can see in this chart that has all zeros filled in that at some point the net pot of money in each country starts going negative. That's not good. That means it's losing money over the fact that there is this type of temperature change. But it's more dramatic than just the losing money. You can look at the parts per million. And this prediction goes up to the year 2195. So we're going up a couple hundred years from now. It's the model. So let's first look at these CO2 numbers. This has it going, with no one does anything, to 3,000 parts per million. That's 0.3% CO2 in the atmosphere. We're around 400 parts per million today. What are the effects of CO2? If you try to hold your breath, you can't kill yourself. Because at some point, the CO2 concentration in your blood reaches a high enough level that you fall unconscious. When you fall unconscious, you can no longer hold your breath. Your body says, get rid of that brain control saying, don't breathe. I'm going to start breathing again, and you live. That's why you can't hold your breath and kill yourself. Good thing, right? You can choke and the CO2 will build up enough, you won't get oxygen, and you'll die. So clearly at too high of a CO2 level, you just plain die. That's not at the 3,000 parts per million. 
There have been a lot of studies with divers, because if you're scuba diving and you're using some rebreathing apparatus and you can see at what level, you'll start having problems. At about 2,500 parts per million, mental impairment sets in. So at 3,000, we're going to have a world full of impaired people. That's probably not good. Um, 5,000 parts per million, a half a percent, that's the industrial limit in the United States, the occupational health and safety. If you're in some plant, some steel smelting plant, and you're making lots of CO2 and so forth, that's the occupational health and safety limit. Of course, you don't live in that 24-7. You work in that environment. There are lower limits here and there elsewhere. Maybe they don't make a lot of sense. But clearly, in these thousands, um, especially a couple thousand ppms of carbon dioxide, that's not going to be good for human health. The 10 degree centigrade temperature range is particularly not good. This will cause something like 28% of the ice on the planet to melt. We'll have great floods. We'll probably have stopped the conveyor belt. We will have uh, dramatically changed where the growing zones are, changed the weather, and everything else. This type of unadulterated carbon dioxide production in use is clearly bad. So what could we do? I'm now showing you a graph of carbon use based on oil, natural gas, and coal over the last few decades. And you notice that it hit a peak of about 90% of our energy was made from fossil fuels in the United States, and it's not too dissimilar for the world, at 90% in 1970. And since that time, it's decreased. Now it's just a little bit over 80%. That's very good. That means that other 18% is something that does not produce global warming. This trend should continue, reducing our CO2 energy consumption reducing that percentage of our energy that's made from things that produce CO2 is the best solution to global warming, but it's one that will take some time. This curve is not going to suddenly drop to zero. There's some downward slope, and I hope that downward slope will continue. So, you could enter that into the spreadsheets. You could say, aha, we're going to go not from this constant level, but we'll keep reducing this. We put in some numbers. You may have to find that you need to add some numbers into the geoengineering column as well. Otherwise, through just reasonable CO2 reduction, that temperature will still start climbing. And then temperature climbing hurts GDP, hurts people, and affects things in real ways. So you throw in a little geoengineering into your charts. You try to get all of the different regions of the world reducing CO2. Clearly, places like India and China will probably not reduce it very much since they're on a tremendous growth rate and have such a large population. The other 121 countries in the world are probably very difficult. Many of them are very poor to get some concerted policy. So you can take this chart and you can play with it and you'll have an exercise to do so. What's the best can be done? What if you get a bunch of people doing this or you think about this a long time and you get the best numbers in? Here's the result. On this sheet, you can see that it's quite possible through this combination, a reasonable combination of reducing CO2 and some geoengineering, that you can keep the temperature rise to what we have today, to 0.78 centigrade or so over the next two decades. Will the carbon dioxide level in the world increase? You betcha will be up to maybe 1,300 parts per million. We're at 400 today. I'm not saying people are going to stop using carbon. We're going to gradually reduce it, replace it with other things, add some geoengineering to not overheat the planet. In this scenario, we have 1,300 parts per million of carbon, 0.7 degrees of temperature increase like we have today. You will have melted 3% of the ice on the planet. According to this model, this economic and science model on global climate feedback, that's about as best as you can do. I sure hope we have other solutions and that our governments cooperate together to be able to make some global CO2 type agreements. But in the dot end, it comes down to economics. And that economics 
is probably likely to include some type of geoengineering, some type of engineering fix, not so we can blithely go ahead and pollute to our heart's content, but so that we buy a bit of a respite during this time period where we need to develop non-carbon energy sources and implement them on extremely large scales and do so economically. That's what you need to know about global warming abatement.